So I'm going to talk about the bountiful sea and the prospects for sustainable use of marine bioresources. And I'm a zoologist, so when I talk about biodiversity, I hope you'll excuse me if, for the most part, I talk about the biodiversity of animals. And those of you who are microbiologists or plant biologists or mycologists will say, no, you're way off because there's far more diversity in these other groups. But if we're talking about animals, there is a greater diversity of animal life in terms of the major groups, the sort of grades of organization in the seas and the oceans than there are in terrestrial environments. And I tend, I'm a marine biologist, marine zoologist, I tend to take the view that terrestrial environments are really a bit boring. They're sort of dominated by insects and some other arthropods and vertebrates, all of which are more or less the same. They've got a head and four legs and so on. Whereas in the sea, we have a huge diversity of organisms and the vertebrates of which we are a reasonably well-known example is just a small little subgroup within the chordata. And we have the hemichordata, and we have echinoderms, this forming one of the main groups, the deuterostomes. And echinoderms, of course, are predominantly marine organisms, as are most of the chordates. We have this group called the trochozoans nowadays, um, which includes mollusks, hugely well known, but also the annelids, and it's true, there are earthworms on land, but there is a great diversity of annelids called the polychaetes, which is what I studied while I was a zoologist at the university. And we have ecdysozoans, so we have a huge diversity of organisms. We have some organisms like cnidarians, jellyfishes and corals, which are really predominantly marine. Occasionally I'll put up a picture like this with some pretty pictures of animals, and I'm not going to talk about them, they're just for you to look at while I continue to talk, and give an idea of the marine species. Cnidaria, 10,000 species in the sea. Polychaete, 12,000 species. Mollusca, an incredible 75,000 species. Crustacea, 38,000 species. And then there are some phyla, and I couldn't get them all on the slide, so I just list, list a few. Phyla, that is grades of organization with relatively few species, but they're predominantly marine. So we have a big diversity a lot of biological diversity in seas and oceans. And what I really want to do in this lecture, if I ever get round to giving the real lecture as opposed to just reminiscing about things, um, I want to exploit the ways in which people may be able to exploit this biodiversity without in fact destroying it. And I, th I think will require is a move from being hunter-gatherers, that is fishing, towards farming of marine resources. But in the doing so, I think what we will have to learn to do is to farm the entire ecosystem or representatives of the entire ecosystem, which is certainly not uh, the current state of affairs, although things are changing very rapidly. A bit more reminiscence from some pictures which I shan't necessarily refer to. But when I first entered this university, I started a systematic study of reproduction in marine worms. And my children, when people, when they were at school and people asked them what they were doing, they said, what does your father do? He studies the gonads of marine worms, they would say. And this was, and then about 30, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, they would say, oh no, he's a worm farmer, and that sort of had a great deal more credit. But in fact, I was a boffin-like academic studying the reproduction of a variety of marine creatures, mostly uh, members of this group, the marine worms. How could you spend 40 years studying the reproduction of marine worms? <laughs> 
One thing is that they're all different. I used to challenge my students. I think of a mode of reproduction, having live offspring. I can think of a worm that does that. Think of a mode of reproduction, big bang strategy, breeding once in a lifetime and dying. Oh, I can think of lots of worms that do that. And they have a huge diversity of reproductive strategies from live birth to big bang strategies and we became very involved in things like I give it the fancy name transduction of environmental signals how do the worms respond to the environment we needed to know what was the energetics how did energy flow from the food through growth and then later partitioning into egg production and so on very interesting subject. We learnt that the worms keep time with the phases of the moon, with the time of the year, with the time of day. We learnt to do things like the cryopreservation of larvae and that little picture there is a baby worm which is actually being into liquid nitrogen recovered from the liquid nitrogen, woke up, oh it was a bit cold in there, wriggled around and perfectly capable of growing into a fully developed adult. Very very interesting. We became eventually interested in the molecular biology of some of these things, particularly the molecular biology of the clock genes and modifying the time of breeding. And the modifying of the time of breeding gave a clue to uh, what we later did and which has I think a quite serious relationship to the main theme of my lecture. And I want to refer to the inaugural lecture uh, given by Professor R.B. Clark, Bob Clark, when he entered the university, he entered, came in about 64, he gave his inaugural lecture in 1967 and I shall pop around and see him next week and he'll, be, he'll think it's hilarious that anybody should be able to remember something he said in his inaugural lecture all those years ago, but I can. And he said, living as they do in crevices and burrows, worms don't move around much and they swarm to the surface of the sea for breeding where fertilization takes place. Well, they don't all, but certainly some do. But it is absolutely a waste of time swarming to the surface of the sea to reproduce if when you get there you're the only one. <laughs> you have, so they tend to do it so that masses, tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of worms will gather to the surface of the sea to breed, lay their eggs, fertilize them and then die. Now you imagine that. What you have got to be able to do is to entrain all those processes culminating in mature sperm and eggs such that all the worms in the population can leave their burrows, swim to the surface of the sea and breed and die. How do you do that? They're the sort of questions that I wanted to ask myself and they're the sort of questions that led to some of our latest research and I'm just referring to this my last major research grant was to join a consortium exploring the molecular basis of tidal and circadian clocks in worms and we developed systems so we could record their behavior and we discovered that marine worms particularly this one the raised by is perfectly capable of measuring and responding to the movements of the celestial bodies. They can respond to the moon, to the day length, to the season, so that the worms actually learn to know the time of day, time of month and the time of year. This input information shows in their behavior and it's expressed in patterns of gene expression in their brains. Now that story I hope will continue but I'm afraid I ran out of time and money and so there are lots of interesting things still to be done but if you understand how organisms work then you can begin to 
exploit that knowledge. And Cliff kindly referred to the fact that a few years ago I became involved in the development of a company farming marine worms, first as bait and then later as aquaculture feeds. And a key factor was being able to produce baby worms all the year round. And the picture there, we closed the life cycle and we could modify the time of breeding. I have to say that it is actually a great regret to me, and some people in the audience may have been involved with sea bait. In the end, the economic models and the situation for the company has moved and currently worm farming is not carried on in the northeast of England but it is being carried on in Thailand, in China, in South America. In many cases uh, this is a pattern that we will see, the development of technologies and new ideas which subsequently move. But I think it was one of the first demonstrations of something which was very important which was growing organisms which do constitute the natural food of fish. And what I would like to do now is to move on and I want to ask the question, well, how does the study and culture of marine worms, and excuse me, I've indulged myself talking a little bit there about uh, very interesting research we're involved in, how does it relate to the main theme of my lecture, which is the question of the sustainable food production from marine resources, and this debate about whether fisheries or aquaculture should be the main source of aquatic foods. And I think the answer to that lies in understanding the marine food web, and this is a diagram, and I'm sure my colleague Frank Evans will tell me, yes, that's pinched from <laughs> a publication of about 40 or 50 years ago, and it's relatively simple, and it's out of copyright, so I can put it in here. But it shows two things. One, we have a food web, which uh, a food chain, which is going from primary production in plant cells, in this case, the phytoplankton, minute plant cells which live in seawater, passes through the minute animals which eat them and eventually into small pelagic fish and so on up the food web. But very importantly, there is another trophic web here, which is going some something which in this diagram is called detritus, through benthic invertebrates, including, of course, marine worms, and then up to benthic fish, such as, for instance, the cod. Now, this is very important in relation to the major theme of my lecture, and I'm going to come back and show this diagram again and say a little bit more about it. Now, marine biodiversity includes a rather large number of fish species and according to FAO, the Food and Agricultural Organization, around 600 species of fish are the target of commercial fisheries. This seems to be an abundant resource freely available to the fisher. So people could remain hunter-gatherers in their exploitation of these resources. But there's a problem. In fact, the world's fish resources are not inexhaustible in relation to human beings' capability of catching them. And for many decades, since the turn of the century and a little bit before, the supply of fish to the world was rising each year. But after decades of increasing, the supply of fish from the fishery stopped increasing during the mid 1980s. It seemed to reach an upper limit. China, shown in the darker blue here, continued to increase for a while, but so too has ceased. 
and I've taken this slide because I want to speak with great respect to fishermen and the people who earn their living in what is in fact a very arduous and dangerous uh, trade, catching fish. And here it tells us that in 1904 there were 143 registered fishing vessels in North Shields. 60 years later only 22, one of which was a steam trawler and the web page I've taken this from quite rightly pays tribute to the brave people who served on these ships. But what we had was increasing technical capability. I'm a member of the School of Marine Science and Technology now. Shipbuilders, equipment builders, the equipment can get more and more efficient. So the development of steam driven ships, hydraulic winches and steel, are they called hawsers, wires and so on, handling massive fishing gear, highly efficient methods for finding and catching fish stocks, electronic methods, the ability to produce ice and to chill and freeze captured fish for later landing. All of these things was a technological revolution which enabled people to find and catch fish stocks. What I want you to also think of, if we went back 600 years to prior to the Reformation, pre-Tudor times, you would find that in this country aquaculture, the farming of fish, was the norm. Almost every monastery would have had its fish pond growing carp and freshwater fish. The rise of industrial fishing, which gives right at the view of ever increasing fish landings, is a late 19th century, 20th century phenomenon. So what I want to do now is to examine some aspects of the current status of fishing and the emerging aquaculture industry. I'm going to take as my source of information the publications of the Food and Agricultural Organization UN, FAO Rome, and they very happy, conveniently for me produce a biannual report called SOFIA, the State of the World's Fisheries and Aquaculture, which is published every two years. And the diagrams that I use in the following section were taken very largely from their all very nice, sophisticated shades of blue. If it looks like that, it's an FAO um, <laughs> diagram that I've stolen. The latest one for two year 2010 has just been published. Some of my slides ref re reflect that. Some are based on earlier SOFIA. This is for the SOFIA two years ago, which reported to 2008. No, this is the contemporary one, to 2008. So we've seen that there was an upward trend in the number of fish being landed until about the mid-1980s. And then so, so, a trend like this. From that time, it's been a decline, with the maximum world catch for the fisheries being about 90 million tonnes. And something else was happening as well. And that we can refer to under the general term overfishing. You won't have time to refer to these, but we can define, and the definitions are from FAO, an undeveloped is a new fishery. And if you have a new fishery, if you take out more f nets, go fishing, catch more fish. Whereas if you go to an overexploited fishery, even if you increasing fishing effort, the amount of fish you catch will go down it's overfished and you can see this diagram shows very clearly the trend from the 50s through to our present time the number of undeveloped stocks in the world is virtually zero the number of developing stocks where you can still have an increasing yield by increasing fishing effort is going down the number of fully exploited stocks and senescent or over-exploited stocks is by far the majority. 
and a tiny number of stocks have been left alone and may be recovering. So here is a very serious trend and a sort of snapshot for the present time, I think about 3% in 2006 were considered underexploited, 20% moderate, 50% fully exploited, can't get any more, 17% are overexploited, 7% seriously overexploited or depleted. Really serious figures, and this has not changed over the last uh, two years. If anything, it's got worse. So we have a conflict between the fishery and human demand for fish. <coughs> on the one hand, most people I read commentating on this take the view that the world fishery at its current levels is not sustainable. They point to the fact that fishery landings are declining at about 0.7 million tonnes. That increased numbers of the landings are from fisheries which FAO classifies as being depleted. And many commentators comment on the, tr the fact that the trophic level of the fish that's being caught is being driven down towards the bottom of the food web. But human population is growing and this week I think we learned that there are now 7 billion human beings in the world and in a number of countries the seventh billionth person is, will be, grow up to be famous and fish is increasingly recognized as a component of a healthy diet so we've got an, a population which is tending to eat more fish and a population is growing with fishery landings declining this figure is from an oldish publication it shows the number of fish per person per year in the North Atlantic Basin. It's going down. So, we have a situation where fish is regarded as a healthy food option, sometimes regarded as a gourmet food, sometimes regarded as an essential component of total protein in food. And the map shows the percentage of total dietary protein from fish in different countries. And what we have to remember here is that some of the countries such as these in sub-Saharan Africa, where fish is a really important part of the diet of people, are those countries which happen to have the lowest total protein intake so that in the United States about 25 kilograms of protein per person per annum world about 16 kilograms Africa about 6 kilograms so that fish in this form is incredibly important for some people so is aquaculture an alternative to fishing? If you were my students, I'd sort of force you to put hands up and things, but I won't do that. But you can ask yourself, coming into the lecture theatre, your previous experiences lead you to believe that aquaculture could and does provide a sustainable alternative to fishing? Or do you believe, because of the things you've read or been told or your teaching or whatever, that it does not and I rather hope that someone would like to know more because then I can continue <laughs> to give this lecture there are one or two very very influential papers and this is a paper by a, a fishery biologist who I have the greatest respect for Daniel Pauley Canadian and he argues that he's quite in a very influential publication in Nature that since the world fishery production cannot meet the demand for fish there's no point in trying to manage it so that you should you should manage fishing to rebuild ecosystems and that then is and never was any reason to suppose 
that marine resources could keep pace with demand. But then he goes on to argue, I think, that fisheries in a world of scarcity may well be profitable. Well, of course, that is a little worrying because if it's true, then really only the wealthy would eat fish. And we've seen from the previous diagram that might threaten the livelihoods and well-being of some of the world's most underprivileged people. The analysis assumes that the model of aquaculture that we see now is the only way it can exist. And it's that view that I really want to challenge during some of the remaining part of this lecture. I want to ask, why is there a view that fish farming is unlikely to provide an answer to the seemingly limited supply of food from the capture fishery? This seems counterintuitive, yet it's widely believed. Is that view justified? A couple of quotes. Aquaculture is the world's fastest growing food industry. It has been growing at about 10% per annum per annum for 30 or 40 years. This year, aquaculture, or in the figures published this year, the next two year period, the growth has set back to about 6% growth. But it is still the world's fastest growing food industry and FAO say aquaculture is set to provide most of the world's aquatic foods. Currently it's about 47% of total food, aquatic food production, we'll call it fish, it's lots of things, comes from aquaculture, not fishing. Now in this country, most people simply don't know that. It's not part of their uh, view of the world. And this is a graph taken, I think, from an FAO report, but it shows aquaculture production taken in isolation, and this means aquaculture in, uh, in the modern sense. And to give an idea of how this scale works, when I came to the university, in 1962, aquaculture would not figure on the curriculum because it hardly existed. Fishing and fishery management would have been the thing. 1971, I joined the staff of the zoology department. No one said, you better study aquaculture, Peter. No, it wasn't really a significant issue. In 1977, I was asked to look at bait digging in the British Isles. Worms were being overfished. People were taking more worms out of the beaches than was sustainable. And that led me to being involved with aquaculture through worm farming. And much of what I'm saying to you today comes because I have been one, a zoologist, as you see, studying worms, and also get involved in the aquaculture industry through the company we helped set up, which eventually began to play in global markets, and those global markets have in fact taken over, I think, from where we got to. Now let's combine those aquaculture data with the fishery. And you get a graph something like this, again from FAO, from 1950 through till nine, from here onwards, the growth in fish supply, which has been sustained, has come almost entirely from the growth of the aquaculture industry. Fishing, apart from in uh, some inland fishing, has stayed constant. Now, we're often told aquaculture consumes fish. I would like you to look at the maths. If 40% of the world's fish supply comes from aquaculture, it simply cannot be true that every kilogram of farmed fish requires five kilograms of capture fish 
yet it was said on the television, so it must be true, just a few weeks ago. There is something wrong with the way people interpret the data. We can look at what's predicted for the future. Predicted fish supply, this is the yellow shows demand based on interpretations of population growth and trends in feeding habits. The orange is aquaculture which will continue to grow. This deep yellow is fishing which at best will stay more or less as it is. And the purple is the projected deficit. So either the world is going to be increasingly short of aquatic food supply or something has to grow and this aquaculture sector has to grow even faster than it has done because the fishery sector cannot. And what this shows itself is in trade flows. I just picked out one of these, again, are FAO figures. For Europe, in 2008, the internal trade flow was 26,000 odd million US dollars. And the importation from around the world, including from these countries in sub-Saharan Africa, amounts to 18 and a half or a bit more million US dollars and that will increase. The same is true of the United States, its deficit at the moment is about 25 million US dollars per annum. So aquaculture, I'm not going to dwell on this, you can find lots and lots of sites that give this sort of view. Farmed fish, if it's not good for the environment or your body, what is, good, what is it good for? a very negative image. The view prevails that aquaculture is a net consumer of fish, destroys habitat, and is a creator, not alleviator of poverty. So is this true? And even more importantly, if it is or was true, is it necessarily true? And that, I think, is where uh, the answer lies. I think we need to look at the statistics in a little bit more detail. We need to say, where is aquaculture growing? What are the regional variations? What species make up this growth? And if we take the growth of aquaculture again, and we now separate, and I didn't do the analysis, I've stolen this from the web. So developing countries and developed countries, you see that by far the greater part of this growth has been in developing countries. And these are mostly China, several countries in Southeast Asia, and some of the poorer countries in Central and S S Southern America. Here's a list in 2008 for the top 15 aquaculture producers. Just a quick rundown here. China, India, Vietnam, Indonesia, China, Bangla Bangladesh, Norway, Chile, Philippines, Japan, Myanmar, United States, Republic, Korea, well, where's the UK? China, 32,736,000 ,000 tonnes. Remember, that is 32 million tonnes through aquaculture. And the world fishery total is 90 million and can't get bigger. USA, richest country in the world. 500,000 tonnes. These are very surprising statistics. In Europe, the top producer is Norway, 800,000 tonnes, mostly salmon. Scotland is a significant player, 
and I would like to urge us to be proud of and supporters of the Scottish salmon industry which may have faults but can improve those producing about a hundred thousand tons of new fish it is a complex industry and we shouldn't just assume that it's one thing the marine capture fishery this is data of a few years ago is the largest sector but it's declining the strongest growth is for inland aquaculture that is the farming of freshwater fish and I said in England 600 years ago we had abundant freshwater fish farms associated with the monasteries that disappeared with the development of marine technology marine aquaculture shows growth but it is much slower and it's a relatively minor sector and in fact most of marine aquaculture is the culture of the salmon which is a freshwater marine <coughs> mixture sort of fish so we can see that and this is a little bit older but it's a fairly clear diagram freshwater fish for 1998 a few years ago the pattern is the same now 17,000 but the biggest value here but I want to point out here crustacea one two three four five down in terms of production in 1998 second in global value the world aquaculture model is not a mimic of the declining fishery it is not dominated by marine fish it's dominated by freshwater fish shellfish and tropical crustaceans so the really successful stories are tilapia and shrimp and amongst the freshwater species can be for national that is local consumption but also export and if you go I'm told if you go to a Walmart or McDonald's and you buy something they're called fish filet then that is tilapia grown in China and shrimp is the world's most traded seafood and for Bangladesh aquaculture production is the third highest contributor to total uh, GDP so we really need to ask ourselves could marine aquaculture develop to the same extent these figures show the landings of cod 1970 wow massive overfishing of cod okay you might look at this graph and say wow wow aquaculture is growing fantastic this scale is trivial compared with the fishery even now and there are some technical factors I'm a marine biologist who studied reproduction. Marine animals tend to have massive numbers of tiny, tiny, tiny babies. A cod will produce about six or seven million eggs. Tiny little eggs. So then the farmer has got to grow those on in very carefully controlled conditions to the point where you can actually stop them to a sea cage or something like that. It's technically very difficult but those technical difficulties are solvable that's for people like um, my university colleagues and students and postdocs and myself and so that's what we're supposed to do solve technical problems it's a question of knowing and applying knowledge so there was a developing Scottish farming industry cod farming industry in Scotland in 2008 it closed and the workers in that industry moved to Norway a great loss to my mind of technical competence and ability but there would be a food supply constraint too 
And here we will have to talk a little bit about aquaculture feeds. And I've used the word there, PUFA, PUFA, or polyunsaturated fatty acids. I will say a little bit more about them. But people say, fish need them in the food. We need them in our food, so we have to get them from somewhere. And currently, there is a major industry based on the Peruvian anchoveta, in which tiny little pilchard-like animals feed on phytoplankton off the Peruvian coast. About 99.3% of the catch is converted into fish meal or fish oil. And of that, currently, about 56% of the fish meal goes to aquaculture, and about 93% of the fish oil goes to aquaculture feeds. Now, it may be, this is a commodity. If it wasn't converting to aquaculture feeds, it would be spread on the land as fertilizer or something. It's a commodity. But 93%, if we don't do something about that, this is a real constraint on the growth of the aquaculture industry. So there is a controversy about fish in and fish out. And people say aquaculture consumes more fish than it produces. Not if you look at it as a whole. If you look at it at various parts, the biggest sector is freshwater fish. And if you look at the production here and the use of fish meal and fish oil, the equivalent capture, the pelagic capture fish equivalent, in the feeds is less than one. So for most of the aquaculture industry, it is clear that it is a net producer of fish. The problem arises with these two little lines here, which is for marine aquaculture and uh, diadromous fish, salmon, where yes, but it's not five to one, the calculations make it about three to four, but it is true that there is significant use of capture fish in that small sector of the total aquaculture industry. And these mollusks, well, we don't feed those at all, um, and the crustaceans are reasonable too. So it's not true that all aquaculture consumes fish, but the present requirement for marine and diadromous fish culture would be constrained by supply of food if we didn't do something about it. And I would argue that actually people need to do something about that. The requirement is for very specific oils, uh, fatty acids. The price of fish oil is increasing and finding alternatives to fish oils in farm fish feeds can be seen as an increasingly urgent issue. And what I think, it, I would like to take the view that it's actually not beyond the wit of mankind to develop farming systems in which the essential ingredients are produced as needed, which is exactly what we do in farming. If we grow cattle, we also grow cattle food. And incidentally, we fertilize the fields with cattle droppings. Why can't we do that in aquaculture? Why can't we have a system of production which uses the entire ecosystem? And Technical stuff, don't need really to talk about technical stuff. Polyunsaturated fatty acids, fatty acids with double bonds in, which make them do the things that we need to do. They put kinks in them and make the lipids more fluid and it's very useful. Very important one is this fatty acid here, DHA, which has six double bonds. And the first double bond is three carbons from this end. That's why it's called C226. And three. 
You also might take supplements, I do, with EPA and arachidonic acid. Lots of people do. Omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. They're often derived from marine fish oils. But in baby foods they're not, because there's too much potential toxin in baby foods. They're taken from the bioproduction from culture of bacteria. Now, what I've become increasingly excited about during the last few years of my research was that, in fact, the sources of polyunsaturated fatty acids in marine ecosystems are diverse. It's not just phytoplankton, but it also includes bacteria. And contrary to what a lot of people think, it also includes animals including various copepods, this nematode worm, these deep sea uh, creatures which are really worms, and this little worm. We now know that they have the capability of making fatty acids. Oh, cows eat grass, what do fish eat? They eat worms, amongst other things. So, if I just illustrate this, I'm going to refer to three colleagues currently working in the School of Marine Science, Dr. Gary Caldwell, who's a student of a student of mine, now employed in the uh, university, is interested in the complex relationships between grazers and pathogens controlling the growth of marine microalgae. Good, pure science. By exploiting that, He's able to work in a consortium who aim to develop a sustainable aquaculture industry. The driver is biofuels. These cells are full of lipid and mass produced algae for biofuels, which is certainly on the cards, would be a source of these essential fatty acids. Another colleague, Professor Grant Burgess and his students, in this case in my town, are looking at microbial species which can easily be cultured. They took samples from deep sea sediments way offshore, brought them into the lab, and they separated 750 bacterial strains, all of which were analysed for their ability to produce fatty acids. They isolated a number of these six different species and now they're working on 15 strains which show high production of EPA and DHA from deep sea. These are new species I think and he's working in association with uh, the industry through an a industrial link to try to develop commercial systems and it's technically feasible. You don't really need to know much more about my work in polychaete worms, but in the last few years we developed little mesocosms in the lab in which we could grow worms and measure everything that went in and everything that came out concentrating on the fatty acids. So we measured all the fatty acids that went in, in the food and in any juvenile worms and the outputs which were the harvested worms did the maths, we also looked at the microbial communities, do the maths, and what it shows you is that when you grow this worm here, living in organically enriched sand in a little oxygenated tube, you get a net gain, a bioaccumulation of fatty acids, including fatty acids, certainly EPA, perhaps not so much DHA, arachidonic acid, and several others. We do clever things with the fatty acids, and my students were doing this, to isolate and quantify each one. And this is the fatty acid gain for a ragworm. It includes DHA, another fatty acid here, C225N3, EPA, arachidonic acid, all of these there is a net production in this burrow system. The animal is circulating sand, so it eats sand, puts it to the surface, 
it drives water into the burrow you can see the oxygenated burrow and that facilitates the growth of certain kinds of bacteria which it then eats and we needed to identify what they were we thought we'd find DHA EPA synthetic bacteria no we didn't we think it's the worm which is doing the biosynthesis but it is gardening these bacteria and eating them what it actually does is promote the growth of bacteria and then it eats them another example of an organism low in the food web this little creature here a sea cucumber hugely valuable in China the world's population of sea cucumbers was on the verge of extinction everywhere they occurred people went picked them up sold them they were hugely valuable and I'm happy to say that a research group led by my colleagues uh, Professor Selina Stead and Dr. Matt, uh, Matt Slater are working on a community-led project in Tanzania growing the sea cucumbers selling them to China as a value-adding commodity but the sea cucumber is a classic example of a worm which eats mud and sorry it's not a worm it's a sea cucumber it eats mud and grows on it cycles sediment so and I'm begin do we have to stop at exactly half past five ish at the bottom of the food web we have phytoplankton and benthos and now what fishing does is to squeeze that food pyramid so you get take fish lower in the food chain if you then take the fish as is currently done and use it as a fish food then the cultured fish are even higher in the food chain than the fish you would have caught and many people would perceive that as being a danger and there was a dioxin scare a few years ago about this so current aquaculture feeds are actually contrary to the way the ecosystem works they take pelagic fish and feed them to benthic fish whereas in fact alternative feeds should be developed incorporating this part of the food chain and we could imagine biofuels and terrestrial byproducts I've found for instance that spent brewer's yeast is a perfectly good food for lugworms why because bacteria grow on the brewer's yeast and then the lugworms eat those bacteria so you can start to build ecosystems like this and use them for production so if you like me a person who imagines you could imagine that there could be a completely fishery independent aquaculture sector which grew all its own foods fed them to fish and produced fish which were relatively low in the food chain which should have no toxins dioxins and so on and which doesn't impact on the fishery at all and we've seen that my colleagues in this this university are doing research absolutely fundamental to that type of development the drivers may well be biotechnology to explore other wealths in marine organisms and I'm showing this slide uh, with the permission of this company here Marina which is a French biotechnology company and the photograph shows in a little bit detail the lugworm gill the lugworm gill has a blood which enables it to live in that very anoxic black mud and that haemoglobin is now set to revolutionize organ perfusion media for heart transplants kidney transplants what have you and eventually haemorrhina are quite certain as an alternative to blood transfusion therapies <laughs> 
So huge value in the blood of the lugworm. And hemorrhina, in consultation with some of the people who've worked with me in the past, are now developing production techniques in very clean environments for lugworms. Why? Because they want the hemoglobin. I'll cut out the science, but if you look at it on what is it, eye player or something, <laughs> uh, you can look in the detail. There are there is a huge giant molecule of hemoglobin, which is much much smaller than a red blood cell when water soluble, but which can carry 156 oxygens, which means it can get to cells when red blood cells can't and that is very very important and I wish hemorrhina uh, every success but their output would be the hemoglobin that they want and a waste product and the byproduct would be worm biomass which we know contains all the essential fatty acids needed for fish farming foods so if somebody says to me, no, you can't expand the production of polyunsaturated fatty acids. Yes, you can through biotechnology and through biotechnologically applied aquaculture. So where and how should aquaculture develop? At the moment, most of it is in tropical coastlines. That is where aquaculture is done which is the most competitive environment you can imagine on the coasts of Thailand and Bangladesh and so on. It could move offshore. It could move onshore. A quotation, I'm a strong believer that in 20 years from now most seafood will be grown on land, Zohar said. It can go Midwest, it can go inner city, it can go anywhere. I couldn't agree more. The technologies to do that exist now. The technologies to take aquaculture away from the coast and offshore could be developed. What happens, I think, will depend on the views of people like ourselves and consumers. We have in the northeast of England an Aquaculture Science and Enterprise Centre which is specifically designed to help to promote emerging businesses in this sector. And I believe that the creativity and imagination of young people, and I look over here, is absolutely crucial to this process. I've been a teacher all my life and I think here lies the future. Last year, as a, an assessed exercise, two students were asked to do a business plan. They said, we're going to take a disused mill in Yorkshire, and we're going to build in the basement all this fancy recirculation stuff, and then we're going to put a restaurant, and the restaurant is going to have access to 10, 12 or more species of fish. Each one coat cultured by an expert in the biology of that organism. I looked at this report and said, absolutely, why not? Grow the food and the organisms you need for your economy. So, that's a little bit into the future. And I hope you'll, excuse me, I'm going to stop there. In fact, I think it's my last slide, will you? There. So that's my view of how an aquaculture might develop in the future. Thank you very much for listening.